Daniel Andrews has welcomed the resignation of Jenny McCarkos, appointing Martin Foley as the state's new health minister. For more, I'm joined by former Labor senator and Sky News contributor Stephen Conroy. Stephen, this is extraordinary. We're in a pandemic. Melbourne is very much still in lockdown and we have a new health minister. Do you, do you think McCarkos needed to go? Well, I think she was gone when in the video of her standing next to another minister, Martin Pakula, was he announced uh, that security guards would be part of the, uh, uh, the mechanism to look after the quarantine. And she was standing there on camera with him and then uh, clearly mm. forgot about it and uh, said that she didn't find out until months later. So I think that she was going to go anyway. But I think the evidence that the Premier gave, where he made it clear he believed that the Health Minister was in charge, uh, and that had responsibility left her in, in a possible position. Uh, I mean, she said in her statement she doesn't agree with some of the evidence that was given uh, and uh, had a few other parting shots. But I think that she was she was gone because she was unable to remember a very important fact that she did know about the security guards. Right, and that's why she didn't go earlier? Uh, look, I, I'm sure she she probably didn't remember that. I mean, the amount of press conferences that both Kenya, the health minister, and all of them have done in the last five months is an extraordinary amount. So it would take it would take an awful lot to remember every single press conference mm. and everything that anybody said. But this was an important important detail. Uh, and when that announcement was being made, no one knew that it was going to lead to the disaster. So. Uh, it's probably one that she just literally forgot about. That's, that's what she claimed in a, a later statement before she resigned. But it, it led to questions about her competence and, mm. and people can't, couldn't be worried about the competence of the health minister in a global pandemic. Absolutely. The, uh, that's a fair point that you can't remember everything you said throughout this year, but surely he was, she was briefed on those key issues before she fronted the hotel inquiry. There are calls now for more heads to roll, such as Police Minister Lisa Neville and Jobs Minister Martin Pakula and, of course, the Premier. Do you think they'll all be able to survive this? Well, look, I think the most... Uh, obviously, you've got to wait to see what the findings of the inquiry are. Now, it's about five weeks away, we're being told. But I thought the most fascinating thing, which has yet to be answered, and the Premier, I, thought, I found it extraordinary, the Premier was in a position where he said, I asked the question, who made the decision? And nobody could tell me. I mean, I, that's an extraordinary situation. And uh, Lisa couldn't, Martin couldn't. But I found mm. the evidence of the former police commissioner astonishing. Uh, I mean, they put his text messages up. It was on the day, I think, of the National Cabinet decision. He starts texting and is clearly unhappy with the prospect of the police uh, being part of uh, being part of the uh, quarantine role. And six minutes after he sends one text, he then texts back the same person and says, "No, it's okay. It'll be security guards." So the key question is, who did he speak to? Who told mm. him? Who agreed with his position? which was the police shouldn't be involved. So I think Mr Ashton, the former police commissioner, needs to have a think, uh, a rummage around. He's basically said, I can't remember. Well, here, here's a hint. Let's get his phone records and see who he phoned in that six minutes and find out who it was that he spoke to that allowed him to then come back and say, here's what the decision will be. Yeah, there's still a lot of questions that have gone unanswered. Abs absolutely. The the inquiry has found that senior bureaucrats weren't passing on key information to ministers. For example, Chris Eccles, the secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, couldn't remember if he passed on an email about ADF support to the Premier. How big of a problem is that when you've got secretaries not passing on key information to the executives? Well, I mean, you've got an identical situation in federal politics at the moment where the uh, price of a block of land in Western Sydney to be sold for the airport. Paul Fletcher has stood up and correctly said, a, the first assistant secretary of the department made this decision. I knew nothing about it. I didn't know about the price. I wasn't briefed. Uh, and clearly he was angry about that. So the Premier should be angry. Ministers should be angry if they're not being given all of the key facts 
I mean, you don't need every piece of detail, but you do need the key facts. Now, whether or not a friendly, quick email from Phil Gajans to Chris Eccles represents an offer, I mean, I would say to you, an offer is what the Prime Minister did in June, you know, sent three letters saying, here's my offer. Uh, a quick email between two heads of departments doesn't count, in my view, as a formal offer of assistance. Is this a bigger problem in the government and it's not just an example of what we've seen in the hotel quarantine debacle? Well, I think part of the problem is they concentrated all their power within a small group of ministers, a small group of bureaucrats. And in that circumstance, it's really the bureaucrats that are calling the shops and running the, the show. When you give them that much power, they get all the information and ministers are coming and going. And so I think the, the structure of the crisis cabinet that was established, the, the gang of seven or eight, uh, I think it's it's been shown to be flawed. But more importantly, the bureaucratic processes that are underneath that uh, clearly were deeply flawed. It gave greater power mm. than it should to bureaucrats who then had to make political decisions or decisions that had tragic impacts on people's lives. Just finally, Stephen, all eyes will be on the Premier again tomorrow. He's set to make a big announcement about uh, changes to the roadmap to recovery. There are reports circulating that there will be good news for the construction industry, abattoirs, possibly the beauty, beauty industry as well. I'm certainly hoping so. Um, there, <laughs> do you think there'll be a big announcement for Melburnians that are currently still in lockdown? Uh, will we be able to get out more? What, what do you expect to happen tomorrow? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm hoping for a, a range of uh, small, but but, but important steps. I think he's going to go further than has been flagged in the in the roadmap that he set out a few weeks ago. The results mm. are better than we could have hoped for uh, so far, but that is the function of a rolling average. The trick now is how much is he still going to stick to the five rolling average? I would think some common sense, some discussion, some real-world data would allow him to uh, raise that number uh, from five to maybe between 10 and 20. Uh, which is a yeah. manageable number. Uh, a five number, I don't think there's any comparable city in the world has managed a five mm -hmm. uh, rolling average over 14 days. So I, I would hope that with new data that he's able to give Victorians much better hope of getting out and about more curfew gone. It wouldn't shock me if the curfew mm. goes tomorrow. There's a serious legal challenge. I think uh, it's, it's made a big difference, uh, as many of the measures have. But it wouldn't shock me to see the curfew going tomorrow. Certainly hoping for some good news tomorrow. Stephen Conroy, thank you so much for your time. Good to talk to you.